do apologize for the little bit of a late start. Um, I can only get on this machine certain times, and the last time PHP was not installed correctly. Um, of course, we had a diversion last time where we ended up talking about something other than PHP, so it really didn't matter. Um, but I have a backup plan today if it, did, if it wasn't working, but it is working now, so, so we're in business. First of all, an announcement. There will be no class next Monday. I remember saying at the beginning of class that that's some Monday in September I wouldn't be here. That's the Monday. All right. Um, let me phrase that as there won't be a class, but I do plan on having an activity for you. So there'll be something for you to do that we'll probably discuss on Wednesday. All right. It's funny, and I was thinking about this. Um, if you Google, let's go out there and do a quick Google. So you're talking about this coming Monday? Yes. Okay. So we're talking about today. I'm just sort of You said there's something we'll talk about on Wednesday about the activity. No, we'll talk about we'll talk about the act after you do the activity on Monday. Oh, we'll talk about it the following Wednesday. Right. Sorry. That's all right. Don't confuse me. I'm feeling a little off today, so okay. it would be real easy I'm to right. get it would be real easy to get me confused. So so <laughs> yeah. I don't know, my dad, I took my daughter to the doctor, she wasn't feeling too hot, and I don't know if it was like the suggestion or, or what, but like I feel really, you know, I think the heat is brutal, too. I think the heat is wearing me down a little bit. My son is sick, so. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to the doctor tomorrow, so. He got sent home school today, so. Pardon me? The, the cool friend's supposed to come through. Yes, I did hear that tonight and tomorrow will be substantially well, it's cool. Gonna be, it's going to be 30 degrees cooler tomorrow. Good. Yeah, probably. Oh, Friday? Yep. Yeah, try flicking those. All right, good. All right. By Google, responsive web design. And we just look at a handful of these. What do we see? Media, media queries. It talks about in one of these. What the heck is responsive design, and so on. If we looked at most of these, my guess would be that most of these talk about client-side concepts. All right? But there is, and I'm glad to see this, there is a component of responsive design that exists in server-side code. All right? And we're not going to make you experts in server-side scripting, but if you do know a little bit of server-side scripting, that's another tool in your toolbox. All right? Um, it's nice to know a couple ways to potentially do something. And you can look at it and look at the particular problem you have and decide what's the best way to handle a particular situation. So we're going to study a little bit of server-side code um, to do some responsive design. And we're going to, you know, and, and we're going to see how we could do things based on that. Ultimately, we're going to go and uh, at some point, we're going to make it, I don't know, I don't know what you'd call it, but we're going to go like the whole way and actually direct someone to a different website if they are on a mobile device. But there's things that we can do and keep people on the same pages. <laughs> so the server has a role even if we're not talking about two separate websites. We'll talk about the two separate websites. If you remember back the first week of class or so, we talked about one of the alternatives was um, to direct someone to uh, a different website on a mobile browser. Um, then we learned all these responsive techniques that happen in the client. All right? At some point, we will discuss how to use server-side code to redirect someone to a different set of web pages. But today, our focus is going to be use server-side code to, to make our pages responsive. But we're going to still be talking about one set of pages. Your decision then becomes, because theoretically, <coughs> there you would never have to ever create a separate mobile site, right? Because anything that you could do, you could do via server-side code and differentiate between the two. But then your question becomes, do you want one ginormous, complicated page that has all this server-side scripting that takes into account uh, different environments and, and determines uh, you know, what content to display and how to format it? Or do you want two simple, uh, relatively simple pages 
uh, one designed for mobile and one designed for uh, desktop environment, and you simply have a switch, the switches between the two. So that will become ultimately what you decide. I mean, strictly speaking, you would never have to have two websites, but it would make for some really clumsy looking pages and really some, some gigantic twisted mess of pages probably if you if you took that approach. But if you're just talking about doing a little bit of responsive stuff, then maybe it's enough to do it server side. So really, I guess the question becomes then, whether you go to two or one, is how different are you talking about the two sets of pages? Are you talking about like totally different content? Are you talking about uh, simply a different appearance? All those things will help determine whether you take the approach of having one set of pages that's responsive to handle mobile and desktop through a combination of client and server-side code, or would you take uh, the approach of having two different sets of pages and direct the user one way versus the other. So at any rate, to sort of round out our tool chest here, we're going to look at some simple server-side things. Now. I don't think we've talked about dynamic web pages in this class. I get confused because I, I talk about dynamic web pages in any number of different classes. So um, I don't think I did in this class. All right. A dynamic web page is a page that changes without having to change the code in the page. All right. And we can think of a lot of examples. In fact, most of the most famous websites would be dynamic pages, right? Angel, dynamic page, right? Your page is going to look different than mine. Is there someone coding the HTML to create a web page just for you and someone sitting there when I make a request to code the page just for me? No. There's server-side scripts, and what server-side scripts are, are they're pieces of code that actually create a web page. They actually output HTML code that browsers view and, and make sense of it. Now the nice thing about that is, is then the server-side script can customize everyone's page to be appropriate for them. So you log into Angel, you see a list of your classes, I log into Angel, I see a list of my classes. I have the features of Angel for an instructor, you have the features of, the, uh, of the, uh, an Angel of a student. So one set of code to display those pages, but it looks at who's logged on, what their role is, what, their, what classes they're enrolled in, and on the fly creates an angel homepage for each person that logs on. Again, it would be absurd to think of there being a separate HTML document for every single student here. Right? It, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, it would be impractical and, and wouldn't work. All right. Instead, there's a script that takes a person's credentials and creates that page on the fly for them. Okay? So the idea is, is that we can customize the page. One of the big things, and, and what I'm going to stress in talking about dynamic pages in this class, is that we can customize things based on the individual specific request. In other words, I make a request with my login credentials, I get one page. You make a request with your login credentials, you get another page. Google is a great example of that because, using one of my favorite examples, were I to Google Italian restaurants, <coughs> I'm going to see a list of Italian restaurants in Illyria. All right? Or the Cleveland area. Do you think if someone in Naples Googled Italian restaurants that they'd find that the best Italian restaurants in the world are, are in, in Illyria? Probably not. Or even New York City. Or even Columbus. All right. This page was obviously created based on some information it knows about me. All right. How does it know? that I'm in Illyria, to, to give me a list of Illyria restaurants. I didn't type in Illyria. I'm not logged in to Google or anything. So it doesn't like know based on my user ID where I'm from. 
there's no cookie from previous searches. You know, this is this has deep freeze on it. So every time I boot it, it starts with a fresh slate. So how did it know that I'm in Illyria? My IP address, right? When I every computer on the internet has an IP address, and when I make a request, that IP address goes with my request. So the person at the other end gets that IP address. And IP address are signed to internet service providers, so we can look up the IP address to see which internet service provider has it and come to some conclusion about where I am in, in Illyria. Now, this isn't foolproof. I've had cases where when I used to belong to Century's uh, internet um, through, my, through the phone company, um, when I lived, uh, well, I guess I lived in the same place, it's just I had different internet. Occasionally, it would think I was in Louisiana because their headquarters are in Louisiana, and apparently maybe they shifted some IP addresses from the Louisiana Century up to here. You had a question? No, sir. Okay. So, the bottom line is when I make a request, I give some information about my, myself. And I don't mean like private information or cookie information or credentials, but there's some information that happens that gets sent as part of the request. And what do I mean by request? I mean typing in a URL or clicking a link or, or submitting a form or something like that. All those qualify as requests. All right. So let's go ahead. If I were to do exactly this and there were no cookies and I had not logged in, is the only thing that gives Google any information about me the IP address? Will be the IP address. The only right. thing? That, that's the only thing I'm aware of, certainly. I actually had a problem, uh, again, and like I said, it's not foolproof. I had it where I would type in Google and I would get redirected like to Google uh, DE, which is the German Google, because apparently something in the table of IP address got messed up and it thought I was in there. All right? At any rate, the point is, is this is server-side code. This code on the fly takes information that comes as part of the request and creates a page specific to that request, all right? You can't do that with just plain old HTML. Now, if we were to look at the source of this, all right, it would be a mess, first of all. But if we look real <coughs> closely here, we can see some HTML code. There's a head, there's a body. There's some JavaScript going on here, but there's also some HTML code. All right. So these server-side scripts on the fly create HTML code. So again, think of them like recipes. The analogy that I use in a lot of my classes is think of dynamic pages like going to a subway, a subway restaurant, all right, a sandwich shop, where you go and you order something. They don't have it already made and hand it to you. You ask what, or they ask what you want. You say, I want a, a, a turkey club sandwich. Well, okay, what kind of bread do you want? What kind of cheese do you want? And you can fill in sort of those parameters and they make that sandwich custom for you. It's not like they have a bin of sandwiches out there waiting because there's simply too many combinations, all right? Just like Google isn't going to have a page of Italian restaurants for every city in the, country, uh, in the world, right? There instead is a recipe that takes certain parameters and processes up against a database or some other things to create an HTML page on the fly made custom for that user. Now, that gets sent to the client as plain old HTML. All right? That's what web, that's what web browsers need, right? Web browsers need HTML documents. That's what web browsers can consume. Just like you consume sandwiches. So when you leave a sandwich shop, you come out with a sandwich. You don't come out with a recipe. All right? Now, how does this relate to mobile? The thought is this, that if we can customize a page based on where we're at physically located, could we also customize a page is there other information that we can use to customize a page? Or eventually to redirect the user to, to the mobile page versus the desktop page? 
And yes, there is. One thing that comes across in a request to a server is what's called the user agent. All right? Now, I have a little PHP script that displays I'm in Google Chrome right now. This is how this browser identifies itself as Google Chrome. So I'm on my web server. I'm on this local web server. And we'll talk a little bit more about web servers in a second. But what's important to look at is this PHP script knows that I'm running Google Chrome. This is the string that identifies and it tells it that I'm on a Windows machine and that I'm also running Google Chrome. Let's go and open up Internet Explorer and run the same script. All right. Now it knows that I'm on Microsoft Internet Explorer. Let's go to Firefox. It knows that I'm running Firefox. Let's go and open up our mobile emulator. And let's pretend I am on this guy, an HTC Hero. Okay, a little hard to read. It knows that we're running some version of Opera. And what's more, it knows we're running Opera Mobile. All right. All right. Yeah. Where's the uh, Where's the script stored at? The script's on this server. We'll take a look at it uh, in a second. Okay. The, this This machine has a little mini web server running that we can use for testing and, and oh, for demonstration. Okay. So uh, we'll look at the details of the script. The details of the script right at this point aren't that important. The point is is just like Google can identify the IP address that you're coming from and use that information to customize its query, to, its query or your query to produce results that make sense locally for you, all right? The server also knows what your user agent is. User agent is just sort of a fancy word for, for browser, all right? Um, it could be other things, but among, you know, it, typically it's going to be a web browser. So all of these, here, let's, let's emulate a Kindle Fire. It knows that I'm running Opera for tablet. So even there, if you notice, the difference between what this script produces for a Kindle versus an HTC whatever it was, uh, just a dinky phone, it gave a different result. So it's even sophisticated enough to know a little more information. So really, it's not the binary of mobile versus uh, desktop. We actually can, if we want to, go even further have a page look different on a tablet than it does on a mobile phone and have it look different still on a desktop. The point is, is that the web server knows who's making the request. By who, I mean what the environment is of the client. Knows something about the operating system, knows something about the browser. All right? We can take that information and do something with it. Just as Google takes that information and um, processes it uh, when, it, when it's doing a query. So that's sort of the idea of server-side scripting that um, is responsive. It starts with that assumption. It starts with the, with the assumption that by looking at the user agent, we can come to some conclusions about the environment and we can then 
customize the page for that. Yes? That's the user agent? The user agent is this, this line right here. And now let's just say I get how like Google would pick that up if huh? you made a request. Mm -hmm. What if you just open Google's website or any website and you haven't put a request in yet? Asking for a web page is a request. Okay. So just going in and typing in www.google.com, that is a request. Okay. All right. There is an HTTP protocol. You know, a protocol is an agreed upon way of communicating. And web pages are typically requested through the HTTP protocol. And it's up to the browser to supply all the things that it's supposed to supply. And one of those things is the user agent. So, yeah, anytime you hit a web server, you're getting that data. Or you're supplying that data, rather. And so the browser can do something with it. Now, that's not to say that clever people can't do crazy things like make their browser lie and say it's Internet Explorer when it's actually Opera. There's actually settings in Opera that allow you to, to handle things, like if you had browser compatibility issues, you could switch Opera to IE mode and if it didn't work in Opera or whatever. But that's beside the point. The protocol says that you better give a user agent, so anytime you make a request to a web server, you're going to send a user agent. And again, asking for a page. It doesn't have to be like putting in a form and doing a query like Google. Anytime you request a page, that's making a request. All right. So, this is PHP. All right. This is PHP. Now, um, what is PHP? Um, PHP is a server-side language, and PHP pages are simply a mixture of plain old HTML plus some server-side code written in the language PHP. If you think about it, if we go to a dynamic website, let's say we go to eBay, and we look at what do we want to buy? Let's buy, let's look at computers. Oh, it's going to make me sign out. Shoot. Let's go to Amazon. And let's look around for look around at movies. All right. There's a movie that we can look at. There's another movie we can look at. These are all streaming movies, I guess. <coughs> now, again, this is a little bit different flavor of dynamic pages, but it's still a dynamic page. How do I know it's a dynamic page? Well, because it wouldn't make sense and it wouldn't be practical for Amazon to have a separate pre-made HTML document for every single item in their catalog. I mean, that just doesn't make sense, right? Amazon has thousands, probably into the millions of items, all right, that you can look for. And, you know, if you think about it, every week, you know, how many new books come out, how many new records come out, how many new movies come out. It's just overwhelming. So it wouldn't work. Just like it wouldn't work for LC to have a separate web page for each student in Angel. It wouldn't work for Amazon to have a separate page for, um, for uh, each item. So we look at that. Look at another book. We know that there's probably not a separate page for each one of these. That instead there is a script that takes maybe some of this information and dynamically creates this page for it. But, one second, if you notice, portions of the page doesn't vary from page to page. In other words, if we look at this book, there's still a link for Amazon, there's still a Your Amazon link, there's a Today's Deals, Gift Card Sell, Help, Search, this kind of stuff over here. 
and then a whole bunch of stuff on the bottom of the page. If we go to another book, same set of links up here, same advertisement, same things on the side, same things at the very bottom of the page. The only difference is that middle section. So guess what? The portions of the page that are constant, that don't change, that aren't dynamic, they can be just plain old HTML. All right? The parts that are going to be different then are going to be in PHP or whatever language Amazon would happen to use. Uh, I'm not saying that Amazon uses PHP, but in our class, the dynamic things on the page are going to be PHP. You had a question? Yes. How would that be produced then? Would there be like a PHP form that a, a little worker bees would be sitting at inputting this data as it came in? Like the picture of the book? The well, what there would be is there would be, instead of a .html file, there would be a .php file. Okay. All right? And that .php file would have some static, plain old HTML, just like you learned in CISS 216. For the portions of the page that were different from product to product to product, instead of there being plain old HTML, there'd be code to like look at, at a database, all right, to take the ID that was entered and look at the database. And there would be code to, you know, pull out the name of the image from the database. There'd be code to pull out the title of the book. There'd be uh, code to pull out the reviews associated with the book. There'd be code to pull out all of the things specific to that item. And then that code would create an output HTML to display that. So in other words, it essentially fills in the blanks. If you notice on every page, there's sort of a blank here for image. And that image tag simply gets filled in with the appropriate image depending on, on the product. So then Zeller's publishing house would, would send them specific data that would be put into the data. More than likely, yeah. That, that probably when new things were gone, they'd probably send an XML file. Here's our new releases this week. Okay. You know, and that would be um, somehow uh, entered into their database. Uh, and once it was there, then they wouldn't even have to create web pages. Just the fact that they're in the database will start showing up in searches and all that. All right. So, the thing about PHP, though, all right, it's a mix of HTML plus this dynamic PHP stuff. But the thing about PHP is that it has to be processed before you can see the results. A plain old HTML page, I can just double click it and open it. There's no real processing there, right? Like if you think about CISS 216, you didn't need a web server to view your pages there. You just double clicked them and opened them up through Windows or through your Mac or whatever. It's a little bit different with PHP because with PHP, remember, those PHP files aren't completed web pages. Those PHP files are instructions to create a web page. All right, they're instructions to create a web page. Therefore, something has to do those instructions to take the stuff and actually output the dynamic stuff. All right? So, what's going to do the processing of these PHP files is called a web server. All right? It would have to be a web server and it would have to have PHP installed on it. All right? Um, the two main web servers that exist in the Microsoft world, uh, it is IIS. In uh, cross-platform land, it is Apache. All right? You can run Apache on Windows. IIS, you can only run on Windows. So if you're running a Linux machine or a Mac or whatever, your web server will be uh, Apache. At the end of class, we'll talk about installing a web server if you don't have one. Um, this is actually pretty straightforward. There's some nice little packages uh, available that you can go and you can download fairly easily a web server on, on your machine. All right. Now, in this case, in this in this example, I have IIS. All right. Um, What I will probably do at the end of class, like the last 15 minutes, is I'll probably take my laptop 
and install Apache on that just to show you how that works. All right.